Now, what about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? This is completely different from dilated cardiomyopathy. Again, let's use the law of Laplace to visualize what is going on here. So again, we have our radius, pressure, our wall tension, which is sigma, and then we have our wall thickness, which is that nice sweet little n, my favorite. We know our equation, wall tension is equal to the pressure within the chamber times the radius of the chamber divided by the wall thickness. So the law of Laplace tells us that an increase in wall tension can be due to an increase in ventricular chamber pressure or radius or due to a decrease in the wall thickness. Most of these hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases are due to an autosomal dominant mutation in the beta myosin heavy chain that is important for the ability of myocytes to contract. So these patients actually have a poorly functioning sarcomere complex. They have poor contractile ability. Now what happens when you have poor contractile ability? Do you need to hit the gym and get more contractile ability? Yes. The reason these patients have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is because their myocytes are hypertrophied. They are huge. They've been hitting the gym because they need to get stronger because their beta myosin heavy chain has a mutation in it. It does not work as efficiently as a normal person's. They add sarcomeres in parallel. So instead of adding in series like we did for dilated cardiomyopathy, we stack these guys in a different way, in parallel. And when you add things in parallel, it goes towards the center and obliterates your lumen. This is why it's called concentric. Concentric means towards the center. Hypertrophy means things are getting thicker and larger. There is a particularly unique feature that you need to pound into your brain that we have previously covered, which is selective hypertrophy of the subaortic intraventricular septum. Remember, that is part of the left ventricular outflow tract that is usually asymmetrically enlarged compared to the rest of the hypertrophy going on in the heart of someone with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If we increase the wall thickness towards the center of the chamber as we're doing in concentric hypertrophy, we are obliterating potential space for incoming blood. Look at the size of this lumen. It's tiny. This means that a very small amount of blood will be able to enter. A very small amount of blood is required to reach a high pressure within that chamber. In addition to that, the thick myocardium is non-compliant. If this entire segment is a hard, thick muscle, do you think it's going to distend very well? No. It will not stretch very much under any circumstance to help us get more preload. So if you look at the pathology specimen, it all makes sense. Look at this. The thickness of this myocardial wall is humongous, and this lumen is tiny. These patients have abnormal hearts starting at the level of the sarcomere. They cannot deposit nice parallel myofibrils. They are randomly thrown in every direction haphazardly among bundles of myocytes. There is also an inflammatory component which activates fibroblasts to deposit collagen in between the disarrayed myofibrils. So you have disarrayed myofibrils and then you have collagen just being cranked in everywhere because this is also an inflammatory mediated disease. Look at this chamber. There's absolutely no space for blood and that's a real bad situation. So when these patients exercise, they have an even greater increased demand and the heart just cannot keep up with that chamber. That's the size of a golf ball. It needs more blood to flow than that. We need to be able to pump much more blood than what can be filled into that tiny lumen. In about one third of patients with this disease, there is also a dynamic outflow tract obstruction because of the large subaortic interventricular septum that is part of the left ventricular outflow tract. Now I've mentioned it a couple times, that means it must be important, right? Right. So imagine your left ventricle, which is right here, it has a huge subaortic septum. So this is the subaortic septum. This is your left ventricular outflow tract. Now think about this. Here's your left atrium. This is your left ventricular outflow tract, this way. So this is your ascending aorta, essentially, right? And this is your left atrium, and this is your mitral valve. This is one leaflet, and this is another leaflet. Remember, there's anterior and posterior leaflets held by the anterolateral papillary muscle, and the posterior leaflet is held by the posteromedial papillary muscle. So here's the situation. In someone with subaortic or below the aorta interventricular septum hypertrophy, 
The problem is that you can have a dynamic outflow tract obstruction. So the heart overall is hypertrophied, but there's abnormal hypertrophy to an increased degree in this segment here, where it's kind of bulging out. So when there's high flow through this tiny little aperture because of this hypertrophied subaortic septum, the mitral valve leaflet can get sucked in due to the high flow vector through this very small diameter. So huge flow velocity can actually pull in the mitral valve leaflet and cause a dynamic obstruction. This is called the Venturi effect. So the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve smashes against the hypertrophied septum and there's transient outflow tract obstruction. So in addition to an already low preload, we block our ability to pump out blood in the middle of systole. It's just like, hold up, hit the brakes. And this can lead to an immediate syncopal episode if the forward perfusion is low enough. This is what you're worried about when you're doing physicals on young athletes. You need to make sure that they do not have any systolic ejection murmurs because systolic ejection murmurs should make you immediately worried about collapsing in the middle of a game from hypoperfusion of the brain and coronary arteries due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In addition to that, sudden cardiac death can happen from an exacerbation of baseline ischemia that these patients usually have going on due to their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now that is the fundamental basis of treating these patients as well. They need to decrease exercise. You need to give them a beta blocker. Why? Because both of these will help to decrease oxygen requirements of the heart. Now what about non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers? Same concept. They block calcium channels within the myocytes and decrease the contractility to decrease ATP requirements. This is great because we're trying to decrease the oxygen demand of the myocytes. You need to give a patient an ICD if they are at high risk, such as having previous episodes of passing out, or they have a history of MIs. I save this last bit of information for last because it is particularly high yield. What association is shown on this image that is super high yield for you to know about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? This image should really give it away. This patient has an autosomal recessive disease that causes amplification of GAA repeats, so it's a trinucleotide repeat, within the gene that codes for frataxin. Do you know what we're talking about yet? So this trinucleotide repeat leads to decreased levels of the protein called frataxin. Decreased levels of frataxin mean that we lose ability to bind iron and clear it from cells. So iron accumulates and causes iron-mediated damage to a lot of cells. The disease we're talking about is Friedrich ataxia. So these patients have low levels of frataxin, which means that they cannot control their iron and its damaging effects to certain cells. This leads to neuronal damage everywhere. And this is why you get the weakness, ataxia, vision problems, hearing problems, and dysarthria, right? In addition to some skeletal manifestations such as pes cavus, right here, look at this. That is super high yield concept for you to know. Now what about the other situation of diabetes that can be seen with Friedrich ataxia? Well, this poor control of iron means that it can go places and create a lot of problems in areas that are highly metabolically active. Neurons are highly metabolically active and so are beta cells within your pancreas. What do they make? Insulin. What happens if you blast them with too much iron because you can't control them because you have low levels of the iron controlling protein for taxin? You get diabetes mellitus. What is another super high yield active area? that's associated with Friedrich ataxia, the heart. Friedrich ataxia patients will often have, and by often I mean 90%, will have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what would you hear on physical exam in this patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, think about it. They have a humongously thick left ventricle wall. Blood is trying to empty into this highly non-compliant chamber because the myocardial wall is as muscular as Arnold Schwarzenegger. So when you hit this with incoming blood, it sounds like water from a fire hydrant hitting against a brick wall. And this is your classic S4, caused by blood hitting a highly non-compliant thick ventricle. So let's keep pushing on here guys with the last cardiomyopathy.
The name here should give you a rather strong hint of what is happening in this cardiomyopathy. There is some infiltration of the myocardium that restricts its ability to expand to receive adequate preload volume. There is no problem with contractility, but the ventricular compliance is low due to some infiltrative process and or fibrosis. So let's write these on the screen as we go, and then we can discuss how each contributes to the diastolic dysfunction that happens. Remember, it is restricted from appropriately functioning as a dilating diastolic chamber to receive blood. It is restricted from doing so. Let's discuss the unique ones first because they tend to be the highest yield. A big one is endomyocardial fibroelastosis. So endomyocardial fibroelastosis. So you have your three layers of the myocardium here. This problem is that there is fibrosis and excessive deposition of elastic tissue, so fibrosis and elastosis. Remember, anything that ends in osis means that there's just a lot of it. So a lot of fiber stuff, a lot of elastin deposited within the endocardium and subendocardium. So which layers are the endocardium and subendocardium? Here, right? This appears in the first two years of life. Now, what about Loeffler syndrome? And this is also known as endomyocardial fibrosis with prominent eosinophilic infiltrate. So again, another endomyocardial naming process going on here, which makes a lot of sense because that's what's involved, right? Just like here, in endomyocardial fibroelastosis, when it was the endocardium and the subendocardium involved, with Loeffler syndrome, this is called endomyocardial fibrosis, so there's probably fibrosis of the endomyocardium with prominent eosinophilic infiltrate. And that's, again, it's in the name, right? This is a restrictive infiltrative cardiomyopathy. So Loeffler syndrome has a bunch of E's in it, E here, E here, endomyocardial, eosinophil, and that is what's going on here. It is very similar to the previous disease, except that we add eosinophils. Eosinophils are very helpful if you have a parasite, but not helpful when they are releasing the highly toxic major basic protein into your heart. If you release major basic protein onto your myocardium, it's like dumping acid directly on it. There is necrosis and dramatic fibrotic tissue deposition as a healing response. This fibrotic tissue is not very good at allowing expansion of the ventricle. Therefore, there is decreased ability of the ventricle to accept blood. Now what next? Let's do hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis, we already discussed, it is an iron overloaded situation in which iron accumulates in via the Fenton reaction, which is a great way to remember it because it's got iron elemental symbol in it, creates reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species damage myocytes. Now what about sarcoidosis and amyloidosis? These are both infiltrative processes. In amyloid, there is deposition and formation of beta pleated sheets. These beta pleated sheets are not going to go anywhere when they get into that myocardium. There are two types of amyloid restrictive infiltrative cardiomyopathy that you need to remember. The first one is that classic one associated with old age, which is from transthyretin accumulation. It is a protein made by the liver that transports good stuff like thyroxine around. But if you have way too much of it, you can start to deposit it within the heart in the formation of amyloid. Now, amyloidosis, so this is one, now two is amyloidosis. Again, it ends in osis. That means that there's amyloid everywhere. This is a systemic disease, which can actually have an isolated cardiac component too. But the important part is that when this amyloid deposits in our heart, our body does not like that, and it will induce a fibrotic reaction that will eventually cause a restrictive-like cardiomyopathy. Again, sarcoidosis is an infiltrative process that not many people understand, but in some sort of cytokine-mediated process, there's also a fibrotic response, and we get a lot of fibroelastic tissue, limiting the ability of our heart to completely receive blood in diastole. Oh, quick flash quiz snuck up on us. What type of cardiomyopathy is associated with Friedrich ataxia? We just did this, so it's a great review. Let's do it. It is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 
Remember, patients with Friedrich ataxia commonly die of cardiac pathology. It is a trinucleotide repeat in the frataxin gene. Frataxin is a mitochondrial protein that protects against some of the potential harmful effects of iron. This protein is really high in the heart, the brain, and the pancreas. Without a properly functioning frataxin protein, there is unregulated oxidative stress caused by iron accumulation in these organs, the heart, the brain, and the pancreas, also in neurons in general. These patients develop cardiomyopathy from myocardial involvement. They have neurological problems such as ataxia and neuropathy from neuronal damage and diabetes mellitus from pancreatic beta cell destruction.